Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure now. All right, so let's talk about Mill um, and his life, where he came from. I asked you to read the chapter on Mill, too, for this week, so it includes some of this information. But John Stuart Mill is a utilitarian, of course, so we're going to be getting liberalism from the utilitarian perspective now. And I think you'll see as we move through his arguments, it's quite a different style of argumentation. And some people prefer it because it seems practical and less theoretical. Um, it's maybe more understandable to the average person, so it's more easily kind of translated into policy arguments and things like that. Um, so as you see there, Mill, uh, Mill's dates are 1806 to 1873, and he was born to James and Harriet Burroughs Mill, eldest of six children. And James Mill was a utilitarian philosopher whose best friend was Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy Bentham was definitely the more famous and more accomplished of the two, but James Mill in his own right is a, it was an accomplished author. But Jeremy Bentham was like a, the big grand poobah of, of uh, utilitarianism. And now we look back at his philosophy, it may seem a little simplistic because over time, people like John Stuart Mill, more than James, modified utilitarianism and made it more reasonable. But as you probably are aware, utilitarian, utilitarian's great mac maxim is the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Um, and that really was Jeremy Bentham's position, was we want to have laws and policies that create the greatest happiness for the greatest number. I should have said happiness because there is a difference between good and happiness, at least I think so. Um, utilitarian arguments like Bentham's reject natural rights as too vague and unsupportable a foundation for their liberal arguments. Okay? So a utilitarian is likely to say, well, where are these rights? What, what do they really stem from? You know, are, are you just talking about ideas here based upon your particular definition of human nature, which may or may not be true or universal? Okay, so, you know, they, they basically argue there needs to be something more solid and scientific, and this was a time when, you know, people were attempting to apply scientific thought to social sciences, okay, or social studies. Not with great success <laughs> in other areas. Um, uh, this was a time in which you had, um, these pseudo-scientific racialist theories going on too, you know, so. Um, but that's where people were at at that point in time, very impressed with science, with evolution, with the theory of evolution and so forth, and wanting to see what they could do in studying human, human beings from this perspective. So the sole standard for Jeremy Bentham was utility, meaning the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Jeremy Bentham. Um, Bentham's philosophy, as I said, seems a little simplistic at this point. You remember from the Gorgias, way a long time ago, an intro to political thought, that uh, Callicles makes a similar statement. You know, what's, what makes me happy is good. What, what causes me pain is bad. You know, yeah, very kind of, simplistic. Yeah, yeah kind mm -hmm. of a primitive um, position. It's, it is simple, um, and I think that's what attracted Bentham and others to it, is that, well, what can we know other than what makes us happy? Everything's subjective, right? Which both Gorgias and Callicles agreed. Everything is more or less subjective, so what other measure is there than people's response to any particular stimuli, okay? And we can measure what's good policy on the basis of what the greatest number of people find pleasurable and call that good and enshrine it in our laws and policies. Um, and what they find dis unpleasurable or painful, we can call bad and prohibit or try to discourage, okay? Now, Bentham had this method, it was really more or less a, a set of criteria for assessing pleasures. 
So he did have something more than a public opinion poll that he was working with. <laughs> and the first was the intensity of it, okay, whatever it was, the duration, how long it lasted, the certainty, which is this, things feel better if you know that you can have them and have them again. Does that make sense? And purity, that is, how unmixed is the pleasure with pain, okay? So that would actually take, remember also in the Gorgias how um, Socrates argues with Callicles about good and bad, and he says, but, you know, in a lot of our, in a lot of our uh, experiences, pleasure and pain are mixed together when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, and so forth. So Bentham did say that the unmixed pleasure is better. So that was a little bit of an elevation and understanding of the fact that, that some pleasures are better than others. Okay, so that's what he means by purity. But he didn't go too far in that direction because he wanted to have maximum freedom and he understood that people experience pleasure in their own way, in other words, individualistically, right? Um, and therefore, his judgment about what would be a pure pleasure might not be the same as somebody else's, okay? All right, so for Bentham, the aim of government was the greatest happiness for the most people, and this impacted on the value of individualism, okay? So Bentham did say that the individual freedom and the individual ability to express himself is important, but not as important as the majority's happiness, okay? So in other words, if you had a minority of people who insisted on doing things that were unpleasant and painful, to everybody else, <laughs> then they had no necessary, there's no right for them to do that. You know, first of all, there's no rights, period, in this way of thinking. And secondly, if you, if you see that it impedes the pleasure of the vast majority of people, then you can do something about it. So according to Bentham, like the Phelps protesting at like a soldier's funeral, yeah. we can make that unlawful. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then, I guess, going back to the painful, if they just morally don't agree with it, that would be painful to somebody else then? Potentially, yeah. You think abortion? I'm thinking more along something like that or something like gay marriage, like. Mm -hmm. So that, yep. that seems like that could it was a problem. It's a, it's a problem with utilitarianism that there's no sense of natural rights. So you couldn't argue for, say, gay marriage on the basis of gays having equal human rights. Because there are no human rights in this perspective. It is a matter of the majority of people. Now, did Bentham think that, that this would result in squashing lots of people's freedom? Probably not. Maybe he assumed that there was a greater amount of agreement or could be than, than there is now, okay? Um, many of the issues that we struggle with that are really tendentious, tendentious issues are, weren't even on, or hardly barely on the radar screen then. So, but yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking about a minority of, of people insisting on something that really causes, uh, I don't know, I mean, pain in the sense of displeasure, disgust, or whatever, then, yeah, you know, you could pass a law against it. And this is a, a limitation of utilitarianism that John Stuart Mill saw, okay? So John Stuart Mill never brings back in natural rights exactly, not in the theoretical, with the theoretical foundation of somebody like Locke, okay? But he brings back in something like rights with his idea that minorities' freedom needs to be respected unless it really harms the majority. And he tries to define the harm principle much more clearly than Bentham did as having to do with actual concrete harm, not just offense that you take, okay? So John Stuart Mill, and then I'll go back into his life a little bit in a minute, but John Stuart Mill um, raised a couple of problems with Jeremy Bentham's ideas, and one was this Socratic problem, which, I mean, call it Socratic because Socrates brings it up, 
that some pleasures are bad for you and some pains are good for you, d d regardless of what people say or, or think. <laughs> so John Stuart Mill did recognize that you can use philosophy to determine whether something is actually good for people as opposed to what they say. Like, if most of the people in the country think that eating burgers and fries is pleasurable, you know, eating burgers and fries every day of the week is pleasurable, that doesn't mean that it's good for them, <laughs> right? So, and actually we're kind of in that situation, aren't we, right? So, you know, in that case, perhaps uh, there would be a place in John Stuart Mill's version of utilitarianism for discouraging behavior that is actually bad for people, in this case for people's health. Maybe by educating people, maybe by even regulating the burger industry. <laughs> Um, so there's that. The other thing Mill, Mill emphasizes more than Bentham did is the subjectivity of pleasure and pain to the individual. So that if, if pleasure and pain is that subjective to the individual, then it is more difficult than Bentham thought to have a method or a set of criteria that will actually give you um, an idea of what will be of benefit to the greatest number of people. So these assessment qualifications like intensity, duration, certainty, and purity, those are different for different people as far as how they experience them. Okay, so like uh, duration, duration of pleasure in the senses is very different from person to person. Some people don't, like for instance, if you drink a glass of wine and you taste the wine, it's great wine, some people can taste that for and it goes down, and it's, you know you get a full-blown experience, right? It lasts a minute. <laughs> Other people just don't get that. They, uh, they drink it like, that's great, so what? <laughs> it depends on their taste buds in that case. It's a physical thing, and it varies from person to person. So you're saying so. it's like a unique quality. It's unique to yeah. the individual, mm -hmm. right, right. So there's these subtle differences amongst individuals. So, so Mill questions the the criteria here, well, how, how helpful they are, okay? So for some reason, this is making me think of moral relativism. Because mm -hmm. um, like, I mean, like you said with like the, um, the wine example, well, or the burger example, sorry, it's not good to eat it every day. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have, and so maybe we can regulate it or like inform it, but like things like racism, which is a big leap. Mm -hmm. People didn't, there was a time when it was okay like slavery, um, right. it was okay to be a slave, and so like, the, according to his criteria, you could say you could keep that in practice. It's not good, mm -hmm. but because they've kind of like philosophized to the extent that they can, you know, to try to see if it's not good or not, that can justify. Yeah, right. That's yeah. I I know what you're saying, and and I agree with it. Um, utilitarians have a hard time dealing with these issues because, as you say, if everybody, if the majority decides in a society that, that slavery is correct and morally justifiable and does them a lot of good, then there's no basis for the utilitarian to make that change. Now, if the slaves were the majority of people in society, there might be an argument there. Um, and as we see with John Stuart Mill on women, um, he could make an argument for the utility of women becoming equal to men. Um, so you could make that type of argument with slaves as well, but you don't have to. And he's more or less bucking the trend here, saying, you know, the vast majority of men are incorrect, basically. And if they only understood their true self-interest, they would agree with me. Yeah, but how much traction that gets if society's not ready for it, you know, is another matter. Or whether an argument like that would even emerge is another matter. Um, Frederick Douglass used arguments of a utilitarian nature in his anti-slavery rhetoric. And, you know, in that rhetoric in the United States, there's quite a bit of utilitarian arguments, but they're always alongside rights-based arguments because you know, I mean, the, the value of the rights-based argument in our context was white people had already totally accepted the rights-based argument when it came to themselves. And so, you know, the, the only question was, are 
black people human beings. If they are, then this is logically got to apply to them. Whereas the utilitarian argument would run up against, but you know what? I mean, the plantation system's working for me, you know? I like this, it's giving me pleasure. And by the way, you know, science says that these people are not the same as me. So I, you know, I mean, your objection is, is, is valid and it's a weakness of utilitarianism, um, yeah. Would Bentham have, um, I guess, advocated a, a specific group of people's pleasure and pain, like only people that vote or mm -hmm. only people that can give their opinions? So like not, you know, children, not, you know, elderly who are, you know, sick and have dementia or something like that. Mm -hmm. Did he have a specific group of people that he only applied to that? No, I mean, other than men. I mean, I think that uh, that Bentham and other utilitarians were thinking of men as sort of the primary opinion holders, and then, if you know, whatever they decided, everybody else would benefit from. So there was that, and probably children. I think, I'm not sure about that, but I'm you know I'm fairly sure children because they don't have the full reason to be able to decide what you know or experience to be able to decide what they want. Outside of that, though, no. I mean, Bentham was against property qualifications. Um, he wanted, after his, he developed his philosophy a bit, pretty deep and thoroughgoing democracy, but for male voters. Okay, yeah, right. That was what John Stuart Mill kind of threw into the mix of utilitarianism, is actually suggesting that, you know, men, men didn't need to be the leaders in the family. See, the old-fashioned view was women would be represented through their husbands, fathers, you know, the heads of household. It wasn't so much that they would completely be unrepresented, but that the idea of marriage and family was that when women joined that marriage, they kind of melded their wills to their husbands, and therefore their husbands would represent their interests and so forth. So there was no need for them to have <laughs> their own boat. Uh, so kind of along those same lines that during the time of slavery, utilitarianism would not have even taken into account the pleasure or pain of slaves then? No. Okay. No. Not, not, unless some, uh, not unless some genius utilitarian decided to make the argument. Okay. But I guess the weakness of utilitarianism really is that you could just as easily make the argument for slavery using the utilitarian method because you can say, uh, you know, this benefits most people and if they are, they are the minority, okay? And also it can be combined with, this, with whatever other scientific point of view you want. And like I said, at this time, racism was being supported by scientific evidence, which wasn't really evidence, but you know, I mean, people were taking these arguments seriously. So, yeah. But, I mean, I think that these leading utilitarians generally were on the progressive side, okay, and might have and probably did uh, have a problem with slavery, okay. Um, I know John Stuart Mill did, definitely, um, and I think John Mill, or, yeah, James Mill as well. Not sure about Bentham. So, given the like means to reject mm -hmm. slavery, could they make an argument against so like against moral relativism and say, well, we didn't have that information at the time. Now we do when we see slavery is actually not good for everyone. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but that wouldn't be so much against moral relativism. It would just be a new argument on the basis of utility. Okay. So, but yeah, absolutely, they could make an argument that we were wrong. You know, slavery does not benefit the majority. And really, it, it didn't, right? I mean, in, in the United States anyway, uh, slavery kept the South back. It kept their economy back. Uh, it made life worse for not just slaves, but a lot of other people too. So um, you definitely could make that argument. But I'm just saying that with utilitarianism, other people can argue against that. There's no, there's no solid ground in utilitarianism where you can be certain of <laughs> where to really hinge your argument. 
Um, but it has the rhetorical advantage, you know, as you see reading John Stuart Mill, you can say, you know what, that's pretty persuasive, he's right, you know, maybe I, I would, as a man, maybe I would benefit from having a wife who made money, or maybe I would benefit from having a wife I could talk to, or help, you know, make decisions with, and things like that, because, you're, because they're arguing on the basis of self-interest, whereas the purely rights-based or moral thinker is arguing really in a way that can go against self-interest, you know, saying regardless of how you feel, this is what's right or this is immoral, you know, that's, that's a harder sell in a way, rhetorically. Okay, um, so Bentham, at first, which is probably where he should have stayed, advocated for rule by elites who could decide using his criteria what would benefit the majority, okay? But he couldn't get any traction with people thinking this way, okay? Sort of reminds me, I mean, this, this is a philosopher who definitely wanted to have an influence on politics during his time. And so he lobbied for that influence and didn't get it. So later on, he advocated for political reform to get rid of the elites. <laughs> um, by abolishing the monarchy and the lords and expanding suffrage, not to women, but to every male, okay? So his thought there was that if you expanded suffrage to every male, you would naturally have laws and policies come out of government that would benefit the greatest number, okay? And it would be based on their collective sense of pleasure and pain um, he advocated for universal public education so that the poor would be educated enough to wisely vote. Okay? What would um, Bentham say of democracy? Yeah, Bentham was advocating he democracy. Was, was that pretty much what he was advocating? Yep, yep. Well, by getting rid of the monarchy and the House of Lords, what was left would be the Parliament, and uh -huh. expanding the suffrage would make the Parliament a really pretty representative democratic body. Mm -hmm. Um, so, in frequent elections, so that these people actually represented the common people, an informed electorate, so yeah. And he felt that if people were free to really uh, speak their mind and vote according to what they really wanted, that the outcome would generally be beneficial for, for as many people as possible. So he ended up with the best government governs least, leaving individuals as free as possible to pursue their happiness. All right. Now, on to John Stuart Mill, unless there's any other questions about Bentham. Okay. Bentham is generally looked upon now as fairly simplistic in his reasoning. He needed to be corrected. <laughs> All right, so poor John Stuart Mill. Every time I have to go through this, I feel bad for him. He was a prodigy, or he was made into a prodigy. Obviously, he had to have the intellectual capability of this, and not everybody does, but certainly if he had a more traditional upbringing, he would not have been reading Greek and Latin at the age of seven. But being the scientifically minded people that they were, Jeremy Bentham and his father, James Mill, decided to make a sort of experiment on their son to see just how much his son, I should say Mill's son, <laughs> seemed like their son. <laughs> um, just how much John Stuart Mill could learn and how they could mold and shape him into being a superior philosopher. And so they really did do that. Um, Mill wrote a, his autobiography, which was published in 1873, which was well after he had changed his mind and modified his utilitarian ideas. And he looks back on, on his childhood with some resentment um, because in the long run, he says, this strict and rigorous education gave him a nervous breakdown and caused him a lot of pain. He says, I have no remembrance of the time when I began to learn Greek. I have been told that I, it was when I was three years old. Now, if I recall, my, let's see, my son started to recognize letters 
maybe around the age of two and a half, you know, alphabet time. <laughs> and may, by the time he was four, he was reading simple, you know, sentences and words, and then he went off to kindergarten, and that's pretty normal development. So to be able to read at all at three would be pr pretty extraordinary, but not out of the question. There are three-year-olds who can read, but Greek. <laughs> well, it just seems really contradictory to me because Bentham's whole argument was about pleasure and pain. They're causing yeah. John Stuart Mill pain by are reading they, this. Or are they going to get him through the necessary pain, like Socrates said, Devil's Advocate? That's true. You uh, know, making him advanced and educated. And but they're deciding for him. They're because not giving he him have the reason. Right. To do so. He, and, he, and you won't until you're maybe 12, 13 years old, by which time it's too late to take advantage of the pliable brain that you have when you're, mm -hmm. you know, a child. Um, before we totally scoff at this, there are lots of parents who try to, to do something maybe a little less radical, but still, you know, with their kids, to try to give them that, that boost that they need in life. But generally speaking, they think of it as a boost for the child, whereas these two really did kind of think of this as an experiment. You know, what can we, you know, what can we accomplish with early childhood education, you know? Well, I was going to say, ask people like who, you know, like I went to private school until I was in eighth grade and a lot of my friends went on to like private boarding schools and, you know, just the, like that kind of like intensity and stress and like, you know, weekly breakdowns was like really normal because of all the pressure to mm -hmm. like excel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when young people are probably not the best suited to deal with that kind of pressure and it's always struck me as odd that we put so much pressure on them when they're young. You know, you t we tend to think, well, they can bounce back from anything. But, you know, life experience makes things easier to deal with, I have to say. You know, the older you get, the less things can actually hurt you. I know that sounds weird, but it's true because <laughs> you've been through all this stuff. so. You develop some uh, calluses, so to speak, and it makes it easier to deal with with crises and maintain some sense of poise. But when you're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, you have none of that experience, and you have all of these expectations from your teachers and your parents, and you know this threat of if you don't do this, well, your life will suck. <laughs> That's a hell of a lot of pressure. <laughs> to put on young people who don't know what to do with that. And Mill, you know, got way more than than even that the child of the most helicopter, you know, parents today would have gotten out of these two. Um, by seven years old, uh, he is told he had read the first six dialogues of Plato in Greek. Okay, now I know a little bit of Greek. I tried to learn Greek in grad school so that I could do my own translation of Thucydides when I needed to. And Greek is a highly complex language. You have to learn a different alphabet. We actually don't know exactly how those archaic letters even sounded coming out of people's mouths. And there is innumerable permutations, declensions in, in this language that I never mastered. I tried to figure out the ones that were used in Thucydides the most, basically. <laughs> and it was very tough sledding, and did you know a child could learn that at all is really extraordinary. Did Bentham and his and James Mill speak Greek fluently? They would have, yeah, they did. So then, wouldn't it be like growing up in a bilingual household? Yeah, like if your well, parents were like Russian or, or Greek, I mean. Yeah, but I, I don't. I think that they were teaching him how to read scholarly in a scholarly way. So it wasn't just that they occasionally were speaking using Greek in their in their everyday conversation, which you're right, people do, and it's picked up pretty easily by children. But they were sitting down with a book and, you know, going <laughs> through it and teaching him the vocabulary and and the uh, the grammar and you, you know. understood like the actual meaning behind it though at that age? Well, you know, good I question. I don't know if you would have been developed enough to, to like grasp the concepts. Right. Probably it's only to a limiter. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, you know, like, I went to Hebrew school, and I mean, I can read and like, write in Hebrew and like read the prayers and have no idea what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But 
we learned it from a very young age. So right. It doesn't really mean anything to us. Yeah, because you don't really know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And so you go back at a certain point if you're going to do that, right, and actually learn it more as a, a teenager? Is that when people do it if they're going to? Or well, not? We did it from like age like four to 17. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Where was, I'm just curious, I don't know if you know this, but where was his mom in all of this? Was she just like, <laughs> Good question. You know, like, what, what, was she just Taking okay? Taking a backseat. Like, yeah, she was, so she was basically you know, okay. Like, you know, I can't really do anything yeah, about this. Yeah, like, like, this is my son that's... <laughs> getting hammered. <laughs> yeah, with all of this stuff, like... No, was too busy not subjecting her the responsibilities of mother. <laughs> right, yeah, this may be another reason why John Stuart Mill defended women, because women and his mother had no de decision-making power, and he makes note of that in this book, that even when it comes to parenting, they have no decision-making power in the current system. All the power lies with a the husband. They can delegate it if they want to, but they don't have to, over a child's education, how they're reared, you know, who takes care of them, and so forth. So. Um, he objects to that, um, and maybe that's one of one reason. So he didn't get to have a lot of childhood, basically. Now he made a good decision, probably for himself, um, about employment. Interestingly, and maybe this was just for the security of being able to get away from his family and have his own life. You know, he took a steady job and he kept this job for his entire career. He so didn't. He never went to school. Well, he didn't need to go to school. I guess, yeah. Well, I didn't know if he wanted to go pursue something else. And no, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, he got his education at home. Well, he was going through college. At I think seven he years went. Old. He, I think he took some college classes, but he didn't pursue a higher education full blown. It's, that's an extreme form of homeschooling. Yeah, exactly. Extreme homeschooling. So he, he took a job as a clerk, and he ended up as an examiner, uh, and it took him a long time to get to raise up in the British, British East India Company, which was a company that, that dealt with um, exports and imports, and also to a certain extent with slavery, slave trade. So, um, and we know that Mill was against slavery, he says so right here, and, and he criticizes it. But he stayed employed by this company. Um, so, I mean, it was a pretty mundane job for most of his career, leaving him lots of time to write. Okay. And he started out re remaining in his father's fold philosophically. But by 1826, that'd be three years into his job, he stood up against the philosophical radicals group that he was a part of, along with Bentham and, and Mill, and disagreed with Bentham's utilitarianism, which was his father's utilitarianism. And at that point, he had that mental breakdown. And as a result of that, had time had to have time, took the time, to be able to recover, not working for a while, and just dealing with all of the things that had happened to him up to that point. And one of the things that he says he did was study poetry. Because he had so lacked the emotional side in his education, he felt that poetry was a good thing to study, to kind of try to rediscover or discover that emotional side. Okay, so he made an attempt. What person do you think, I mean, because it does sound like a very like mechanical, like emotionless upbringing. Mm -hmm. What kind of person do you think that would make him that suddenly he's like, oh, feelings, poetry, social and that? Not very, yeah, not, not a very happy person. And I don't know that, that this, you know, I don't think he would have um, been cured by this attempt. I think it, it he became more normal and happy, though, over time as a result of just basically confronting the fact that he had been in, kind of abused, basically. Um, and a lot of people never have that enlightenment about their youth, but if they've had some sort of difficulty, they stay in denial. So, I mean, if a person actually acknowledges 
that there's a problem, that's a first step towards <laughs> toward full recovery. And the fact that he reached out to poetry just means that he was in a way, you know, still his father's son. There had to be a method, you know, for for finding out what he was lacking, and that was his closest thing he could think of. His father died in 1836. Now, in this case, a father's death might have been a freeing experience. You know, there's something about the death of a father or mother if you have been, if you have disagreed with them, that is the ultimate um, sea change. <laughs> and after his father's death, he did feel freer to write in disagreement with his ideas. And he, again, he didn't completely break from utilitarianism at all, but he began to explore how those ideas were flawed or did not go far enough. So he argued, of course, that all pleasures are not equal, that you have to distinguish amongst pleasures, and we have to apply a non utilitarian measure, a Socratic measure, basically, of whether they are good for us or not. So if we're going to develop policy, we can't do that just by taking a poll or even by making assumptions about what most people would want, but we have to actually reason about what will benefit people in the long run. Also, he wished to rank pleasures according to what was the most humanizing, and so he emphasized those pleasures like education, the arts, you know, that actually help people to discover their humanity, to experience their humanity. Okay? Even though many people, especially initially, find those painful. Okay. Um, Okay, he also pointed out happiness could be a byproduct of doing other things. Okay. Now we kind of know this now. There's a documentary on Netflix called Happiness. If you haven't watched it, you should. And it, one of the points that it makes, and it's all based on social science. They've you know, done all sorts of studies and polls and things. But one of the things that they emphasize is that helping other people and forgetting about your own needs and pleasures, experience of pleasure, actually in the long run makes a person happier. So this was something that John Stuart Mill pointed out. Okay? Bentham did not notice that. And so Bentham's utilitarianism really does seem more selfishly motivated. You know, it's really about the person and, and their experience without recognizing that sometimes if you lose yourself in other people's needs, you automatically become happier as a result, okay? Another point he made was, in agreeing with Plato and maybe even more so with Aristotle here, political and social participation are intrinsically worthwhile and should be encouraged. So 